So Savitri has risen up into the, the world of eternal day. And um, there she has reached a certain height and seen the Godhead there, this wonderful appearance of the divine who carries within him all worshipped eyes looking out from one face. He carries within him these four states of the Godhead. Virat, the king of matter, and Hiranyagaba, the dreamer of the subtle worlds, and Prajna, the all-knowing wisdom from which everything proceeds. And beyond that, the fourth state, the ineffable, the unknowable. These, it is a great delight to her to see this wonderful Godhead. And he speaks to her. First of all, he congratulates her. How have you reached so far? But then he tells her that heaven and earth, spirit and matter are forever divided and separate. So she will have to make a choice. Either she can return to earth and be in inner communion and connection with Satyavan, uh, exploring the world of duality or the, the law of duality. Or if she wishes, she can leave the earth and live with Satyavan in heaven. Hmm? So he invites her O oh, immortal, to felicity arise. And today we'll read part of Savitri's reply to him. So I'm going to start reading at page, uh, page 685, line 100, 517. On Savitri, listening in her tranquil heart to the harmony of the ensnaring voice, a joy exceeding earth's and heaven's poured down the bliss of an unknown eternity, a rapture from some waiting infinite. A smile came rippling out in her wide eyes, its confident felicity's messenger, as if the first beam of the morning sun rippled along two wakened lotus pools. O oh, besetter of man's soul with life and death and the world's pleasure and pain and day and night tempting his heart with the far lure of heaven testing his strength with the close touch of hell. I climb not to thy everlasting day, even as I have shunned thy eternal night. To me, who turn not from the terrestrial way, Give back the other self my nature asks. 
Thy spaces need him not to help their joy. Earth needs his beautiful spirit made by thee to fling delight down like a net of gold. Earth is the chosen place of mightiest souls. Earth is the heroic spirit's battlefield the forge where the archmason shapes his works. Thy servitudes on earth are greater king than all the glorious liberties of heaven. The heavens were once to me my natural home. I too have wandered in star-jeweled groves, paced sun-gold pastures and moon-silver swords, and heard the harping laughter of their streams, and lingered under branches dropping myrrh. I too have reveled in the fields of light, touched by the ethereal raiment of the winds. Thy wonder rounds of music I have trod, lived in the rhyme of bright, unlaboring thoughts. I have beat swift harmonies of rapture vast, danced in spontaneous measures of the soul, the great and easy dances of the gods. O oh, fragrant are the lanes thy children walk, and lovely is the memory of their feet amid the wonder flowers of paradise. A heavier tread is mine, a mightier touch. There where the gods and demons battle in night or wrestle on the borders of the sun, Taught by the sweetness and the pain of life to bear the uneven, strenuous beat that throbs against the edge of some divinest hope. To dare the impossible with these pangs of search. In me, the spirit of immortal love stretches its arms out to embrace mankind. Too far thy heavens for me from suffering men. Imperfect is the joy not shared by all. Oh, to spread forth, oh, to encircle and seize more hearts till love in us has filled thy world. Oh, life, the life beneath the wheeling stars. For victory in the tournament with death, for bending of the fierce and difficult bow, for flashing of the splendid sword of God. O oh, thou 
who sounds the trumpet in the lists. Part not the handle from the untried steel. Take not the warrior with his blow unstruck. Are there not still a million fights to wage? O oh, King Smith, clang on still thy toil begun. Weld us to one in thy strong smithy of life. Thy fine curved jeweled hilt call Savitri, thy blades exultant smile, name Satyavan. We'll start this side today, Patricia, you'll begin. On Slavitry, listening in her tranquil heart to the harmony of this ensnaring voice, a joy exceeding earths and heavens born to die, the bliss of an unknown eternity, a rapture from some mercy Thank you. So Savitri is listening in her tranquil heart, very quietly and calmly she's listening to what the God has to say. She's listening to the harmony, the beautiful music of that voice. And that voice is ensnaring. It captures you, enchants you. As she listens, it pours down on her a most wonderful joy, a joy exceeding, greater than the joys, all the joys of earth, all the joys of heaven. It's the bliss of an unknown eternity, something unknown, transcendent, beyond a rapture, an intense delight from some waiting infinite, some infinite world of possibility that's waiting beyond the highest heights. Mila. As my his confident felicity's messenger, as in the first beam of the morning sun, little alone, true waken those fools. Mm. So she looks at him, she listens to him, she listens to what he has to say, and she smiles. She smiles with her eyes. A smile came rippling out in her wide eyes. And that smile is the messenger of that joy that she feels so confident and joyful in being able to hear him and now she will reply with all that joy in her heart. Her eyes look, it looks as if the first beam of the morning sun rippled along two wakened lotus pools. The beautiful eyes of Indian women are often um, compared to lotuses. No? Yes, it says they're like pools full of lotuses. No? And the sun, the first beam of the morning sun is catching them, uh, put uh, a ripple of light. This is the beautiful smile that's coming out of Savitri's eyes. 
No, her two eyes, her eyes are like pools, and it's as if those pools, deep pools of her eyes, have just been wakened up by the first rays of the morning sun with this beautiful smile. Rosa. Oh, mister of my soul, the life of death, and the world's pleasure and pain and day and night, tem tempting his heart with the fall with you of heaven, testing his strength, with the close touch of hell, I climb not. Climb, I climb not. Climb, I climb. Climb, not to take everlasting day, even as I have shunned thy eternal yeah, so that's what she calls him, besetter of man's soul. Somebody who is challenging and attacking the soul of man. She says, Lord, that's what you are doing. You are, are challenging the soul of man. You challenge man with all these dualities, with life and death. Hmm? Two sisters. <laughs> we, we said uh, day and night are the two sisters, yes. Life and death. The world's pleasures and pain, day and night. You are tempting. Tempting can be, mean kind of attracting, but it can also mean testing. So you test his strength with the close touch of hell. You attract him with the promise of, the, uh, of, of heaven, but you test his strength by the close touch of hell. He feels that, and that is a test of his soul. So she says, I'm not going to climb. I'm not going to rise up to live in your everlasting day. I'm rejecting that just as I rejected that uh, eternal night with which he tested her, challenged her. No? She's going to speak about herself. So. For me, who turned up from thy first year away, drew back the other self my natural eyes, thy space need me not to help their joy. Their please is beautiful spirit made by me. To feel did I delight down like a net of gold. Yes. <clears throat> so she says, to me, I'm not going to turn away from the earthly path. I'm remaining on that path. And I'm asking you to give me back that other self, Satyavan, the other self, my partner, that my nature is asking for, demanding for. She says, you don't need him up here in heaven. Thy spaces, your heavenly paradisal spaces, don't need him to make them a more joyful place. They are already so full of joy. Hmm? But earth needs his beautiful spirit. His beautiful spirit that has been made by you. Earth needs him to fling delight down, to spread delight everywhere like a net of gold. A beautiful golden net that will capture souls for the Lord. No? And then she speaks about earth, Bhuvana. 
Earth is the chosen place of mightiest souls. Earth is the heroic spirit's battlefield. The food where the oceanism shapes his works. The thy servitudes on earth are greater, king, than all the glorious liberties of heaven. Yes. So this is something for us to remember when we think that earth is too difficult for us. I remember somebody, uh, the, an account by a person who had had a, a very wonderful, uh, what we call a near-death experience. But in fact, this person said that he had actually died. He had uh, died of cancer and left his body. And then he had a wonderful vision of the earth. He, he said many things about it, but what always sticks in my mind is that he said, every soul which is on earth is a heroic soul, a hero. So this is a, a wonderful way to see our hum fellow human beings with all their funny ways and their difficulties and their this and that. We are in disguise. The soul is within. But every human soul is a heroic soul. So he said, it's even earth with all its challenges is the place which the most powerful souls choose to come to. Earth is the heroic spirit's battlefield. It's like a forge, and a little later on she uses the word smithy. A forge is where a smith forges iron. No? And that's very hard and difficult work. No? She's saying that earth is like a forge. That's where the archmason, the great craftsman, is shaping his works here in this forge. He's out of all these difficulties. He's creating wonderful works of art. So she says, thy servitudes, being your slave on earth, is greater, king, than all the glorious liberties of heaven. In heaven we may feel free, but it's a greater thing to be God's slave on earth. Chandra. In appearance, we are the ones to you in a natural form. I too have wandered in star dweller fields. Faith, sun, garden, pastures, and many silver swords. And have the harping laughter of their stains. And usually, under Let's pause there. So she says, I've lived in heaven. That's my natural home. I have lived there and I've wandered there uh, in their star-jeweled groves. Groves are spaces in forests and often flowers will grow in the groves. But it's as if the groves of heaven have stars instead of flowers. And I have paced, I have walked through pastures, grassy fields that are golden like the sun, and moon silver swords. Swords is grass, especially soft grass that's nice to walk on. Um, moon silver swords under the moonlight, the, the soft grass, short grass, maybe silver. And I've heard those heavenly streams and the music that they make, which is like music on harps, you know, the harping laughter of their streams. And I have lingered, I've 
moved slowly under branches which are dropping myrrh. Myrrh is a very rare perfume, a wonderful perfume. So it's, a, I suppose, a kind of resin. So as those heavenly trees are exuding glorious perfume. Chandra. So, ask, yes. Um, are two? Two. He, Why two? No? Because he's inviting her to come to heaven as if she's never been there. But she says, well, you may have blessed souls up there in heaven, but I've already been there. I have also had this experience. I know what it is. That's why she says, I too, like you. I too. I too, like you. Yeah. The same level. Huh? Yes. yes, exactly. The same level, huh? Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I do have written in the face of light, touched by the current image of the winds. The older rounds of music I have drawn. In the, in the rhyme, this is rhyme. Spontaneous. Spontaneous. No, spontaneous. Spontaneous. Yes. Wishes of the soul. The great and dancers of the cross. Yes. So I too have reveled. I've enjoyed very much your heavenly fields of light, which are touched by the ethereal raiment of the winds. Ethereal, it's something very, very, so fine. Here, We might talk about being touched by the raiment of the winds. The winds blow past us and we feel the touch of their garments as they pass. But she says ethereal because in heaven there isn't this earthly air. There's a much finer element, the element of ether, much more subtle. So those heavenly fields of light that are touched by the ethereal raiments of the heavenly winds. And I have danced, I have trodden, I have moved around to the wonder rounds of your music. She says, I have lived in the rhyme of bright, unlaboring thoughts. A rhyme is when, in verse, um, two words have similar sound at the end. Rhyme and time, these two words. Rhyme. And it's a a device in a particular kind of poetry. Sri Aurobindo doesn't use rhyme in Savitri, but in some of his shorter poems, he uses it very, very beautifully. No? Songs often rhyme. No? So that's that way of coming back, not only of rhythm, but of the sound of the words. She says the, the, the kind of thoughts that one experiences in heaven, they are unlabored. They come very, very easily and spontaneously and there's a natural harmony in them. Hmm? So she says, I've lived in that state of of, uh, rhyme and harmony with all the thoughts that are around me. And I have danced, even swift dances, very fast, rapid dances, 
swift harmonies of vast rapture danced in spontaneous measures of the soul the great and easy dances of the gods. Traditional dances used to have set steps and figures that you would have to do. You know? If we, we look in old films, we see the kind of dances that they do. In modern times, uh, young people have gone for much more spontaneous dances with no fixed steps. She says, in heaven, the dances are like that. They are spontaneous, but they are um, governed by the spontaneous measures, rhythms, and uh, speeds of the soul. That's what determines the steps, not just what your body feels like doing or your life force. I've experienced all these great delights that you are offering me. You're suggesting to me that I should leave the world. But I know all those delights. That's not what, I, uh, what I'm uh, doing here. That's not what I am for. Kamala. Yes. Yes, please ask me something. I have a question about line 550. Yes. Uh, yes. Is in the rhyme of bright and laboring thoughts. Yes. Um, in my first interpretation, uh, unlaboring was for me a little bit skeptical about practical thoughts. But that's not what you are explaining now. No, what I'm saying is uh, often here our thoughts are labored. We have to work things out. But there on those higher levels, if thoughts come, they're unlabored. They're so easy. That doesn't mean that they are facile. It doesn't mean that they're superficial. It just means that there's no effort or tension in them, I think. Oh, fragrant are the lanes that children walk, and lovely in the memory of their feet, amid the wider flowers of paradise. Yeah, heavier tread is mine, the mighty touch. Yes, yes, she says, I remember what lovely perfumes are there in those lanes, those little winding roads which uh, your children are walking along in heaven. And she said, I, uh, the memory, if I remember the feet of your children, how beautiful they are as they walk amid the beautiful flowers, the wonder flowers of paradise, of that perfect heaven. But she says, my tread, my step is a heavier step and it gives a more powerful touch, a mightier touch. And she's going to explain what she means by that. Sergei. Mm -hmm. Divinest. Divinest hope. Today I am impossible with this face of search. Amy the spirit of immortal love stretches its arms out and embrace mankind. Yes. There. She means on earth. There. That's the place where the gods and the demons are battling it out in the darkness. No? or they are wrestling with each other on the borders of the sun where the sun 
maybe hardly reaches. She says, that's where I am. There, in me, the spirit of immortal love stretches its arms out to embrace mankind. And she says that on earth she is taught, she has been learning from the sweetness and the pain of life to bear by these contrasts she has learned to bear the, the uneven strenuous beat that throbs against the edge of some divinest hope this is not these easy rhythms of the gods no? this is an uneven beat it isn't harmonious and it's strenuous it's very um, powerful full of effort but that beat is throbbing like a heart throbbing or like music throbbing it's beating against the edge of some divinest hope on earth Somehow, all the effort that's made, whether we are conscious of it or not, is being inspired by, by the divine hope, the hope of a better life, a greater fulfillment. No. What we do here on earth is to dare the impossible. People like challenge. No? Human beings like to do what is difficult. If they see something that's impossible, not all of us, some of us are lazy, but very often, even in the laziest person, there will be some challenge that will wake them up to dare the impossible with all the pain that is involved in searching for that greater achievement. So she says, for me it is this, a spirit of immortal love to embrace the whole of mankind. That's why I have to be on earth. Leila. Too far thy heavens for me from suffering and imperfect is the joy not shared by all. All to spread forth, all to encircle and seize more hearts till love in us has filled thy world. Mm. Yes. So your heavens, they may be very wonderful, but for me they are too far away from suffering men, from suffering human beings. And you are offering me joy, but I don't want that imperfect joy which isn't shared by everybody. What I long to do is to spread even wider to encircle, to embrace and seize hold of more and more hearts until love in us she means in herself and Satyavan has filled the world this is an opportunity she wouldn't have in heaven only on earth oh that's what you say oh I wish but it's not age? No, it's No, there is a distinction. When you say, oh, it hurts, that you would have an H. But oh, without an H, is when you address somebody. You say, oh, mother, oh, Lord. Hmm? Yes?
Suresh. Who like the life winners, the brilliant star, for victory in the tournament with death, for winning of the fourth fierce, fierce and difficult bow, for crushing of the splendid sword, sword of God. Yes. So she's saying, give me life. Life. The life beneath the wheeling stars. On earth here, we live beneath the stars. The perfect worlds may be above the stars. But she asks for life here, beneath the, the, the stars that are turning around, wheeling. I want life so that I can win a victory in the tournament with death. A tournament is a contest between champions. Well, very often two champions. <laughs> the final, always it's between two, two people or two teams. No? So her tournament is with death. She's the champion of life. Life in which there'll be the possibility of using weapons. A bow is the weapon that an archer uses. He has to shoot his arrows. So, and uh, of course in the traditional literature there are stories of bows that are extremely difficult to lift up and string and use. Rama has uh, picked up that bow no, of Shiva. Nobody else could pick it up. And there may be some other stories as well. Also hmm? He also did it. Hmm? To Ithaca, yeah. He had to... He, he was the one who could do it because nobody else could do it. Nobody else could. Mm, yes. So that's it. No? So that's what she feels. She has the strength to bend that fierce, that very powerful and difficult bow. And for flashing of the splendid sword of God. A sword, of course, has a beautiful long blade. When you use it, it'll flash in the sun. And she wants to be a warrior of God. No. Ravindra. Who love, who sounds to come back in the least, part not the handle from the untried steel. Take not the warrior with his blow unstruck. Next line, please. Are there not still a million fights to reach? Hmm. She says, look, Lord, you are the master of the battle. You are the one who blows the trumpet to say, now let the battle start. No? Here he uses this word lists again. It comes four times in Savitri. It means um, a place where two champions will fight. So then there's a kind of referee who blows the trumpet to say, now you start. You are that one. You're in control of the battle. No? So please, why would you want to separate in your weapon the handle from the blade? No? Don't remove the handle from the blade before it has even, that weapon has even been used once. It's untried. The steel, the, the keenness and strength of the blade hasn't been tested yet. No? Why, why are you separating us? And uh, don't take away the warrior. You're taking Satyavan off to heaven. Don't don't make him have to die before he's had a chance to fight. 
He hasn't had a chance to strike his blow yet. Aren't there still a million fights waiting to be fought? Uh, why are you doing this? Hmm? At the back there. Poor King Smith land on still thy toil began. Built as to one in thy strong smithy of life. Thy fine curved jeweled hilt called sultry. Thy blades ex exultant smile named Satyavan. Yes. He's, she addresses him. You are a king, but you are also the smith. You're the one who makes the swords. No? Continue your work. Make a better sword. They, when he forges the sword, he has to hammer the metal. And that makes a clanging sound. So you have started this work. Please continue it, she says. And what, what they do with swords is they take two different kinds of metal together and they um, join them together by folding them and hammering them many, many times so that the sword is both strong and flexible. If you're a cook and you know how to make puff pastry, it's the same principle, <laughs> exactly. You, uh, you spread the, the, the dough with butter and then you fold it and you fold it and you fold it and you fold it and you fold it. And, you fold it. No. and then when you bake it in the oven, it will rise up <laughs> beautifully. So the principle of making a sword is the same. Yeah. The very hard steel and something much more flexible so mm. that uh, it will be both flexible and uh, very sharp and strong. So that's welding by the hammering the two layers of steel or the many layers of steel are fused together, welded. But also we will have to weld the blade onto the handle. Mm. The hilt it's called, the bit that you hold. Mm. So weld us to one, me and Satyavan. Make us one beautiful sword in your strong smithy of life. Let us live together and grow to be more and more one and more and more powerful to fight your battles. Hmm? You can call the hilt, the holding part, that's, you can call that part Savitri. And the blade is Satyavan. Shall we stop there for today? Yes. On Savitri, listening in her tranquil heart to the harmony of the ensnaring voice, a joy exceeding earth's and heaven's poured down the bliss of an unknown eternity a rapture from some waiting infinite a smile came rippling out in her wide eyes its Confident Felicity's messenger, as if the first beam of the morning sun rippled along two wakened lotus pools. O oh, besetter of man's soul with life and death, and the world's pleasure and pain, 
and day and night, tempting his heart with the far lure of heaven, testing his strength with the close touch of hell. I climb not to thy everlasting day, even as I have shunned thy eternal night. To me, who turn not from thy terrestrial way, give back the other self my nature asks. Thy spaces need him not to help their joy. Earth needs his beautiful spirit made by thee to fling delight down like a net of gold. Earth is the chosen place of mightiest souls. Earth is the heroic spirit's battlefield, the forge where the archmason shapes his works. Thy servitudes on earth are greater, King, than all the glorious liberties of heaven. The heavens were once to me my natural home. I too have wandered in star-jeweled groves, paced sun-gold pastures and moon-silver swords, and heard the harping laughter of their streams, and lingered under branches dropping myrrh. I too have reveled in the fields of light, touched by the ethereal raiment of the winds. Thy wonder rounds of music I have trod, lived in the rhyme of bright, unlabouring thoughts. I have beat swift harmonies of rapture vast, danced in spontaneous measures of the soul, the great and easy dances of the God. O oh, fragrant are the lanes thy children walk, and lovely is the memory of their feet amid the wonder flowers of paradise. A heavier tread is mine, a mightier touch. There where the gods and demons battle in night or wrestle on the borders of the sun, taught by the sweetness and the pain of life to bear the uneven, strenuous beat that throbs against the edge of some divinest hope. To dare the impossible with these pangs of search. In me, the spirit of immortal love stretches its arms out to embrace mankind. Too far thy heavens for me from suffering men. Imperfect is the joy not shared by all. O oh, 
to spread forth, O oh, to encircle and seize more hearts, till love in us has filled thy world. O oh, life, the life beneath the wheeling stars, for victory in the tournament with death, for bending of the fierce and difficult bow, for flashing of the splendid sword of God. O thou who sounds the trumpet in the list, Part not the handle from the untried steel. Take not the warrior with his blow unstruck. Are there not still a million fights to wage? O oh, King Smith, Clang on still thy toil begun. Weld us to one in thy strong smithy of life. Thy fine curved jeweled hilt call savitri. Thy blade's exultant smile Name Satyavan.